Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore a very unusual real-life ghost story concerning a very unusual variety of death omen which appeared to a man in the dead of night before leading him away on a, let's just say, a very strange journey for now. All will be revealed. Now, I've spoken about death omens many a time on this podcast, and in its most simplest form, a death omen is a supernatural sign of an imminent death. It is quite literally an omen of death, an omen that warns us that somebody is not going to be in the land of the living much longer. And the person destined to die could be the person who sees this death omen. It could be somebody connected to them, a friend or a family member, maybe. Or it could just be someone living nearby in the area that it is seen. But the one thing we can take away from all of them is that they are always bad news. Seeing a death omen is not a particularly good thing because it does mean somebody, be it you or be it somebody else, is going to pass away very soon. Now, these experiences of encountering death omens crop up in many different cultures and they can take many different forms. They could be in animal form or as a bird, maybe an owl or a crow. Maybe they are heard rather than seen an audible death omen in the form of strange knocks and sounds. And in Wales, where I am talking to you from, one of the most popular varieties of death omen is the corpse candle, a canoe corf, which, much like Will-o'-the-Wisp, it floats about in the darkness and, based on its characteristics like its shape and its size and its colour and its speed, you can try and work out the identity of the person doomed to die. So, for example, two large corpse candles might suggest two older people are going to die. And while these experiences do vary from culture to culture, there is one consistent factor, and they are usually very fleeting affairs. You might see the crow or the owl in the corner of your eye, and then seconds later, gone. The corpse candle floats in the air among the trees, and then it's off on its merry way and out of sight. But I did mention that this was an unusual tale. And in this tale, the death omen not only sticks around, it makes contact, it has a conversation with its victim. If we can call him a victim, maybe after listening to this tale, you might consider that this death omen was not something to be feared and offered something a little bit more comforting than the usual encounters. Now, to begin at the beginning, our strange adventure takes place in the first half of the 20th century. And we are told that this incident, which seems to have foreshadowed death, possesses a certain impressiveness because it is so trivial. So what we are being told right at the start is that this account was more believable to a contemporary audience because it is so mundane, it is so run-of-the-mill in the way it happened. And what they mean is, if somebody had invented this, they might have put some big jump scares in, some big spooky moments, but they haven't. This has not been embellished to make it sound like an edge-of-your-seat ghost story. Rather, the fact that it's so trivial, as they describe it, makes it even creepier and even more believable as a real life ghost story. Although the author who has recorded this for us, Mary Lewes, does do a wonderful job of setting the scene in her tales. Her descriptions of rolling landscapes and gothic ruins often read like a work of fiction, even though she reported on the factual cases. But one of the frustrating things with 
Luz's account is that while she is wonderful at describing them, she also likes to disguise the exact location of these places, presumably because at the time of writing, they concerned people who were very much still alive and well, or if not, they could still be easily identified by their friends and families. And this was a time when being connected to ghosts was a bad thing for your reputation. The Edwardians had no time for this dusty old superstitious nonsense and had no intention of being tarnished with the crazy ghost person brush. Well, until things like this happened. And while it doesn't really matter nowadays, roughly a hundred years on, when I'm pretty sure nobody connected with this tale is still with us, it does mean we have to do a little bit of detective work to try and work out exactly where this took place. But if we start with what we do know, and these events took place on an estate called Wern Avon, W-E-R-N-A-F-O-N. And there are, or were, a few Wernhavons out there. The most well-known is probably the old mining colliery in Comavon, in my hometown of Port Talbot. But I am pretty sure this didn't take place in Port Talbot, and if I had to take a guess based on the description that I am about to read you, I think this might have taken place in Pembrokeshire along the Avon Wern, the River Wern. But wherever it takes place, let us now set the scene. And we are told that the reader must imagine one of the most peaceful and beautiful spots in Wales, where there stands a large square house called Wern Avon, backed by hanging oak woods, beneath which flows a clear river. Higher up the vale, the stream loiters through pleasant meadows, affording the angler many a tempting pool. But as it reaches Wern Avon, it begins to sing and clatter over stone and shingle, as if it already heard the calling of the not far distant sea. While in flood time, Heavy water rushes down, deeply covering stepping stones and swamping shallow fords. So it definitely doesn't sound like an old colliery in Portal, but it's much more idyllic with hanging oaks and this river flowing down to the sea. Not somewhere you might expect these terrifying death omens to pop up based on that description, but there is more to it. And there are workmen and there are labourers working hard on this estate. And there is a bridge that they use near the house to cross these crashing waters that have just been described. And this bridge, a narrow wooden footbridge, is what saves them and all the other people who live on the other side of the river a considerable walk around to reach the house. So I would imagine that anyone Working at the house, anyone visiting the house would much rather cross this bridge rather than taking a huge detour around it to reach the house. And two men who know this bridge particularly well, and the two men at the heart of this tale, are two labourers working on the estate called Ben and Tom. And again, their real names have been disguised. But Ben and Tom, who we are told are great friends as well as great colleagues and they've worked together their entire lives from boyhood to old age so they've known each other practically their entire lives they've worked together practically their entire lives until to quote ben died and tom felt sadly lonely and forlorn and it was while tom was in this state that to quote again One day, soon after his friend's funeral, he had occasion to cross the river by that little footbridge. And as he trudged heavily along its narrow planks, his head 
bent down in melancholy thought. You can just picture the sadness is weighing him down. He suddenly came to a halt there on the bridge, for there was a man standing in the middle of it. Moreover, as he looked hard at this man blocking his way, he somehow became aware that it was Ben who stood there, his best friend for his entire life, who days earlier had been put into the ground, was there in front of him, and he smiled at Tom as if glad to see him. And while you might expect Tom to be a bit freaked out by all this, a bit scared, we are told that he entirely forgot for the moment that he had seen Ben buried but a few days before, and Tom accosted him, and a short conversation ensued between the two about ordinary, everyday matters. So, there's a lot going on there, and it's not quite what you might expect to happen after your best friend's funeral, to bump into them on the bridge that the pair of you had crossed countless times together during your lives. In fact, as mentioned, Tom was so bewildered that they just started chatting about everyday matters. A good conversation starter in Wales is usually the weather. Maybe they spoke about the weather, maybe they spoke about their families, maybe they spoke about sport, but they certainly didn't talk about anything weird and out of the ordinary, just normal things. Until the conversation takes an unexpected twist and Ben asks Tom if he would like to see the inside of Wernavon because he goes there every night and a strange sight it is to see the people all asleep while I pass through. So by Wernavon he means the house itself rather than the estate but the large square house which is plonked at the heart of it and where as labourers they wouldn't presumably have spent too much time inside of they would have been outside working they would have been living on the other side of that bridge they crossed daily they would not have been inside where the family the wealthy family who employed them lived and even if they had been allowed in occasionally, they would presumably have never been in the private quarters of the family, and they certainly would not have been in their bedrooms and not at the dead of night when everyone was fast asleep. And it would sound like, for Ben, recently deceased, one of the perks of being in the afterlife is that he can now have free reign to run about the house at night looking at things he never would have been able to look at in life. And he wants to offer his good friend Tom a taste of this as well. To quote, Ben offered to take Tom through the house that very night and told him he would meet him on that very same bridge they were standing on at the witching hour at midnight and then without waiting for an answer he glided along the bridge and disappeared and i think that's all the confirmation we need that ben is very much some kind of phantom who has returned from the other side he is not a flesh and blood being still walking this earth now back to tom who is now alone and if he hadn't really realised what was going on up until now, this was the moment when Ben glided away and disappeared that the penny dropped. And we are told that immediately, and with a feeling of horror, it dawned on Tom that the man he had just talked to had actually been dead for several days, and he began to think he had seen a vision or had some extraordinary dream. So I am sure there are many reasons we can think of as to why Tom didn't realise earlier, and maybe if we're being kind, we could just say he was so overwhelmed with grief that he had no idea what 
was going on. But he got there in the end. He realized now Ben was a vision or a dream or something else entirely. But nevertheless, being a courageous old fellow and at the same time curious to see if any results would follow, he determined to keep the strange appointment. So while Tom would like to dismiss this as a dream, he has his doubts. And so, just in case he decides he is going to keep that appointment, he will be there at the witching hour to see what, if anything, comes next. And for this part, I'd like to quote Luz's description. And she tells us that so, midnight found him waiting on the little bridge. A bright moon illuminated the river and banks, and by its soft light the old workman was presently aware of a dark shape hastening to join him. Greeting the living man, the apparition took his former comrade by the hand and led him to the front door of Wern Avon, which, as might be expected, was closely locked and barred. But at a touch from Tom's escort, the great door opened without a sound, and the companions passed into the hall of the house. So there's a lot going on there as well. And I think the first obvious thing is that unlike more traditional ghost stories where they slide through doors, this one, in Ben's case, he can touch it and it opens for them, allowing Tom, who of course is still flesh and blood, to enter with him. The living and the dead can walk in together. And once inside, there, the silence of sleep and complete darkness reigned. Very much as you'd expect, the house is silent and pitch black, yet without a stumble. Tom found himself mounting the staircase with his ghostly guide. Arrived on the landing, the pair stopped before a closed door, which immediately opened, presumably that's Ben working his ghostly magic again, but it immediately opened, allowing them to enter. Softly, they crept into the room, Tom remarking that it seemed filled with a faint bluish light, unlike anything he had ever seen before. And I won't go off on a tangent too much here, but regular listeners might be familiar with the idea of this bluish light being seen at the time of a death omen. It's certainly been mentioned in reference to Corb scandals before, but back to this particular tale. And they gazed at the occupant of the room who was wrapped in deep slumber and creeping out again. They visited all other rooms in turn, Tom becoming more and more bewildered by the strangeness of his experience. And frankly, I'm not surprised he's bewildered. He's sneaking around his employer's home for the first time in his long life. It's late at night. It's the dead of night with his dead best friend next to him. And they are watching everyone sleeping in their rooms, illuminated by some supernatural blue light. But to return to the tale, at last, how he hardly knew, he found himself standing again in the moonlight outside the front door and, turning to speak to his friend, discovered that he was alone. Just like that, his friend had disappeared once more. And much like the last encounter, it's almost like Tom's brain has been switched back on again. He wandered around in a bit of a haze, but now that he's outside and alone again, he's conscious of what's going on, of what has just taken place. And we are told he rubbed his eyes in a 
astonishment when he noticed Ben had gone, for an instant before, Ben had been standing by his side. And if it wasn't for the fact that he found himself walking around alone in the middle of the night outside his master's house, there would be nothing else, no other evidence for what had just taken place. And he would, once more, have assumed the whole thing was a dream. So once more, Tom is doubting himself. He's doubting his senses. He's doubting his brain. And with that, he went home wondering greatly at what had happened. And as far as anyone knows, he didn't see the apparition again before his death, which in this case was not too far away. Because while Tom might have been clueless about what was going on, those he told the tale to had a pretty good idea. Because only a few days after his mysterious experience, his strange adventure, Tom dropped dead suddenly. And they knew that his friend had returned in the form of a death omen, but why he had returned to show him such sights remains a mystery. Was it to offer a dying Tom a crumb of comfort to say, don't worry, all is good here, or could it mean something else entirely? Whatever it was, a death omen, a ghost, just a dream, or all three of them, maybe. Whatever you think, if you'd like to share your thoughts, it's always lovely to hear from people. And you can track me down and follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. And if you've enjoyed this episode and you haven't already, please consider hitting the subscribe button for even more spooky Tales. And if you really enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support it, you can now treat me to a coffee via my website or you can leave a nice review or just give it a quick thumbs up or five stars or whatever the options are on whatever platform you are consuming this on. Finally, as well as a podcast, I've also written a number of books on similar weird and wonderful subjects which are available from all good bookshops offline and on. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian am Rando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, no star. <laughs>